मैं की ओर से आप सभी का हार्दिक स्वागत है कि आज प्रोफेसर आनंद कुमार जो जे नई दिल्ली जवाहरलाल नेहरू विश्वविद्यालय नई दिल्ली में प्रोफेसर हैं वो यहाँ आए और हम सबको भारतीय भारतीय गणतंत्र और राजनीति के कुछ खास मुद्दों पे भाषण देंगे और हमारे सवालों का जवाब भी देंगे मैं अंग्रेजी में बोलने से पहले हिंदी में इसलिए बोल रहा हूं क्योंकि आप लोगों के अलावा इंटरनेट के जरिए काफी और लोग भी हमें सुन रहे हैं और ये रिकॉर्डिंग आम आदमी पार्टी के यूट्यूब चैनल पे भी जाएगी लेक्चर के बाद तो इसलिए मैं चाहता हूं कि हम कम से कम प्राथमिक भाषण को हिंदी में भी दें और प्रोफेसर कुमार के इंट्रोडक्शन को हिंदी और इंग्लिश दोनों में करें तो अधिक देरी के बिना मैं मुनीश से प्रार्थना करता हूं कि वो यहां आए और प्रोफेसर कुमार के बारे में हम सबको अधिक जानकारी दें अ वेरी क्विक वेलकम टू ऑल ऑफ यू फॉर बीइंग हियर फॉर आर लेक्चर चैलेंजेस बिफोर इंडियन डेमोक्रेसी ऑर्गेनाइज बाय द इंडियन ग्रेजुएट स्टूडेंट एंड स्कॉलर्स एसोसिएशन एट नॉर्थ वेस्टर्न प्रोफेसर आनंद कुमार हु इज अ प्रोफेसर ऑफ पोलिटिकल सोशियोलॉजी एट जवाहरलाल नेहरू यूनिवर्सिटी इन डेली इज हियर टू एड्रेस and answer our questions on some of the challenges we all feel lie before democracy in india without much further ado i would like to request munish to formally introduce professor kumar for us thank you munish thanks harsh my name is uh, dr munish raizada i am a pediatrician working in two hospitals here in chicago it's my pleasure to welcome dr anand kumar he is a professor of sociology at gnu and also a member of national executive of aam aadmi party since its inception uh dr anand kumar is not only an academician but he has behind him almost 3 to 4 decades of active socio political activism and there is a long history of that just to give you give you a glimpse i was talking i was looking for a some resources about the e library and in this information technology world i bumped into a one one gentleman whom i don't even know his name is dr lalit sarjan and he told me that there is a library in in one of the remote areas in bihar called viplavi library so okay i went on that website and to my surprise i did see some pictures almost 20 years old pictures i mean that function was 20 years old and i see that this this face seems to be familiar to me and he was none other than dr anand kumar so uh, as i said he has a long history of activism behind him in the days of like what we are doing these days he did in sitting in chicago way back in 1970s when the jp movement started so that time he was precise, precisely doing what we are trying to do right now to 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 ride on the on that i mean to to work on that opportunity which the country has in front of it that is that is a, a, an opportunity for the change and uh, he was making the phone calls trying to do some uh, active work in in chicago arousing the nation about that so without uh, delaying further uh, i would like to invite dr anand kumar for the interactive session so he will talk first and then we will have a question answer session thank you very much thank you munish ji sir thoda sa for this uh, uh, warm introduction and i want to thank the india students association and all of you of north western university to create this opportunity of a dialogue a discussion and probably a debate about challenges before democracy in india today i come to you as Uh, a representative of this new upsurge of hope and a new initiative of creating a constructive challenge 
to those who think that we are doing great job of nation building, of development, of democratizing Indian society and culture. I think that if you look at the present situation of a country which is representing one-sixth of humanity, which has been the torchbearer of human civilization for more than 5,000 years, which led the dark continents of the world from slavery and colonialism to freedom and democracy during the late 19th and first half of 20th century and which has a great legacy of masters from Gautam to Gandhi. It is difficult to suggest that we are doing all right. There is something wrong and therefore we are not able to do as much as we can. We are in a minimalist situation and if you want to create a maximum possibility then you have to see what are the present challenges. When you look at the challenges then you will be able to identify what are the deficits in an otherwise a story of hope and a journey of remarkable success in last hundred years. And when you look at these challenges and deficits, then you will be able to see a few questions which are in need of new understanding, new exploration. No political party, no government is able to claim that they know the answers to those emerging challenges and therefore we need a new wave of initiatives, reforms, ref radical transformations. So my effort in next 20-25 minutes will be to first present a set of four challenges which I call for your convenience four C's. Then we look at six deficits which are very dangerous deficits, which are no more ignorable deficits. And we have to decide whether we do something about these deficits or let the democratic experiment of India meet disasters. And then I suggest four emerging areas, I call them four E's, for whole of India and whole of humanity to come together and solve those emerging challenges. So we start with four C's, look at six D's and then underline four E's and then try to contextualize the emergence of Aam Admi Party which has grown out of rising frustrations. India in the times of Srimati Indira Gandhi and Jayaprakash Narayan that is in the 70s was growing through a phase of revolution of rising expectations. Today we are going through a, a phase of revolution of rising frustrations. And the ultimate expression of those frustrations was a series of hunger strikes by Anna Hajareji, followed by Sri Arvind Kejriwal, Gopal Rai, Manish Sisodia, and then further followed by thousands of people in hundreds of towns and villages of India through torchlight processions, through sit-ins, through joining hands here, there and everywhere. And this wave has touched even the shores of other countries, most prominently United States of America. So let me start salute of all these initiatives and also underline the possibility of a better tomorrow because the first thing which we need to create a better tomorrow is to question today 
and break the vicious circle of silence. Today India is living beyond the conspiracy of silence. People are talking about their pains, people are talking about their expectations and over and above all this they are talking about their frustrations. So if somebody wants to ask me challenges before Indian democracy, I would like to preface it by saying that India is a great adventure in democratizing a society which had very limited resources to engage with democracy compared to the success stories of democracy in the Western world. Our level of poverty, our level of illiteracy, our traditional structures like caste and religion and region had very limited capital for getting into this venture. But we did have a great resource base and that was the Indian National Movement. We had a tradition of sacrificing for society and this included the whole spectrum from Gandhi to Bhagat Singh and from Subhash Bose to Jayaprakash Narayan. And on the basis of that energy and understanding and consensus, we were able to launch into this unknown domain of freedom with justice on 26 January 1952, 1950. In the last 65 years, we have become envy of the world as largest democracy because most of the post-colonial societies started for democracy but ended up in dictatorship, including in our own neighborhood, in South Asia, Southeast Asia, not to talk of Africa and Latin America. We have a multi-party system. We have learned the art of solving our conflicts through electoral competition. So we have learned how to win and lose elections. Unlike many other countries where if you win election, you become a dictator. If you lose election, you land up in jail. We have a free press. We have a vibrant civil society. Our project of social justice has made some impact. So there is an assertion among the Dalits, an empowerment dream among the women. Our project of secularizing a multi-religious society with the backdrop of communal violence in the name of partition of India is also relatively satisfactory development. But there are four deficits which are, of six deficits which are unignorable and they are related with four challenges. First challenge in India, unfortunately, is challenge of corruption at high places. India had a great tradition of selfless leaders and the epitome, the synonym of leader was Gandhi and Subhash Bose. They sacrificed themselves for the best of the country. They tried to identify with the common people and they did not believe that power is for enjoying. They thought power has to be for serving the people. But in the last 20-25 years, the story of corruption has gone from whispering galleries of power to common people. Scandal after scandal has demoralized us and we don't have trust in our power elite. Not only political corruption, bureaucratic corruption, judicial corruption and above all corporate corruption. First challenge, corruption at high places. The second challenge is challenge of crony capitalism. We were living in quota permit raj, which had minimized our efficiency, which had minimized our performance. Sri Rajiv Gandhi, a late prime minister said that we start 100 rupees for delivery to the poor and the needy and 85% is siphoned off in the delivery mechanism by the middle men and women. And we have to check. This was not any radical who was arguing about situation in India. It was Prime Minister of India who had the largest ever mandate and still he was very frustrated with our system. So this idea of quota permit Raj was challenged and we went into the phase of liberalization. We expected that liberalization will bring growth as well as justice. But it has deepened disparities. It has created 
an unaccountable corporate class which has no compunction about their social responsibilities. And the evaluation of performance of liberalization in India in the last 20 years can be undertaken with the help of two indicators. One, what is the experience of ordinary people with liberalization, with 9% growth rate, with the remarkable attraction of global capital and global talent and remarkable reception of Indian capital and Indian talent around the world. It is suggested that in the last 20 years, India has become ungovernable in a large part of India, the so-called red, red corridor from Tirupati Nath, that is Andhra Pradesh, via Jagannath, that is Orissa, all the way to Nepal, Pashupati Nath. This red corridor has been growing because of growing disconnect between the dynamics of development of liberalization and the delivery mechanism for ordinary people, men and women of Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Andhra Pradesh, Orissa, Bihar. And there is a committee which tells us that there is a growing impact of extremism in India. And it's not because of China. China is no more Maoist. It's because of our own local nexus of Tasildars, Block Pramukh, Panchayat Mukhya, MLAs, contractors, and national and international companies who are robbing the people. And they are becoming so helpless that instead of going for parliamentary solution, they are going to these extra parliamentary forces. And the other indicator is the experience of the leaders of captains of industry. One of them is Ratan Tata. And he used this word in the last couple of months that India is moving into a vicious circle of crony capitalism is not the merit of my project, is the capacity of my connectivity with power elite which allows me chance to do my bit. So from Ratan Tata to ordinary uh, tribals of uh, Niamgiri in Orissa, they are all having one common consensus that liberalization has created a deep crisis and that deep challenge is called crony capitalism. The third challenge is centralization. Centralization has become a disease for our democracy. It's a handful of people who are making decisions at the provincial and central level. Assembly and parliament are no more domain of discourses and dialogues and debates. Even the budget of India, the plan of India is in handful minds control and this makes the process of centralization an ugly reality of today's India. There is no internal democracy in any political party. There is a high command culture. Theoretically there was only one political party which believed in democratic centralism that is Communist Party Marxist. But practically all political parties of India are surrendering to the forces of centralization and this centralization is making us feel very threatened because decentralization is the essence of our developmental process. Decentralization is the call of democracy. And this is why Sri Rajiv Gandhi through 73rd and 74th amendment tried to improve our system by giving some power to panchayats and some resources to panchayats. Sri Ramkrishna Hegde, Sri N.T. Rama Rao, Sri Jyoti Basu cooperated in this experiment. But today, even at the panchayat level, we see that it is not decentralization of power. It is decentralization of corruption. At higher level, higher corruption. At lower level, lower corruption. The idea of democracy is now synonymous with the idea of uh, corruption at various levels. And what is the fourth challenge? Anybody who looks at the map of India feels very strange that with the progress of education, and progress of democracy, particularly parliamentary democracy. We are becoming more and more communal in our political discourse. We are becoming more and more casteist in our discourse. And this casteism and communalism is converting democracy in India into dominant caste democracy. It was a middle class democracy in the times of Nehru and Indira Gandhi. Today it is dominant caste democracy. It is not upper caste democracy. It is not OBC democracy. It is dominant caste democracy. 
which makes the Dalits, the women, and the weaker sections excluded. And this is something which cannot be allowed to grow any further. We have to think about what to do. Suppose there are these four challenges. What is the problem? Why can't we live with them? Democracy is a way of learning to live with problems. Not now, next election. Not this president, prime minister, next president, prime minister. No. We are coming to a point of no return because it is connected with six deficits. What are these six deficits? First, of course, is development deficit. Any part of India, there is peak of development called Metro India. Chennai, Bangalore, Hyderabad, New Delhi, Kolkata. And then you see a hinterland. Bad roads, no drinking water, no electricity, no governance in a way. Dada Raj, party Dada, or Jati Dada, or Dharam Dada, Robin Hood syndrome. This development deficit has created two kinds of India. A rising India, aspiring India, and Bimaru India. Bimaru doesn't mean only Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan and Uttar Pradesh and Orissa. Assam is Bimar. Andhra Pradesh is Bimar, particularly Telangana. Maharashtra is Bimar, particularly Vidarbha. 200,000 peasants have committed suicide in the era of liberalization. Not even in British Raj, this kind of a tragedy, this kind of a helplessness was experienced by the peasants of India. This development deficit then creates second problem. Governance deficit. If you are not able to develop my part of the country, I will not respect your capacity, your power, your authority to govern us. And governance has become totally infected by corruption and casteism and communalism. The governing system requires democratization. And many of us are aware that we have not gone to decolonize our apparatus of bureaucracy. Still, there is a my Bab Sarkar syndrome in the minds of bureaucrats. And if there is a good bureaucrat, he or she is subjected to transfer because they are supposed to be radical, because they are working for the poor. The power elite will not allow the governing system to be democratized. The third deficit, because there is development deficit and there is governance deficit, is legitimacy deficit. There is growing pollution of the electoral process. They say that election system is influenced by three forces today. Three M's. First and foremost, money power. Parties are selling and buying candidates and tickets. Smaller parties openly, larger parties secretly. From candidate selection to election date, the primary force, the primary determinant has become money power. The second M is muscle power. It's a strange disease called criminalization of politics and politicization of crime. And parliament, which is supposed to be the seat of lawmakers, is now vandalized by entry of criminals. And with every election, number of people with criminal background is increasing. And it is not us, Aam Admi Party. It is not Anna Hajare or Prashant Bhushan, Arvind Kejriwal. It is on the basis of the report of the Election Commission. And they are trying to check it and they are so helpless. Because it is not independent criminals. Political parties are looking for muscle men and women to enter into political process. Because it influences the process of vote bank building. And then the third power is media power. Media has become embedded in power struggle. We are supposed to be thinking that media is eyes and ears of masses. They must be guardians of democracy. But today, in search of profit, they have some kind of package. Print media, electronic media, and senior most journalists are running around from post to pillar to ask government to create system of checking this corruption of media 
but media is now part of the uh, power struggle and it has become a situation where media money and muscle if they are three together then it's very difficult for good people good parties good candidates to win and this is why Anna Hajare kind of people say that look forget about the electoral process it's so polluted that you cannot make India healthy by going through election process but that's a contradiction in terms if you don't have election then what do you have to make choices to allow conflict and competition to mobilize people for their various positions because democracy is the method of peaceful civilized contest of interest but election process has become so polluted that there is this crisis of legitimacy those who are getting elected are so polluted by and large that ordinary people don't respect them okay you have won the election but we know how you have won the election this is a very tragic situation otherwise if you have won the election you have five years to work peacefully those who have lost the election they have the constitutional duty and responsibility to allow the victor the majority party to run the affairs of the country and you be vigilant opposition but within constitutional parameters and because of this problem of pollution of uh, election process the uh, uh, legitimacy deficit no political party in the country today for the last 20 years with some noble exceptions has been able to get majority in the country there are three large political alliances and these alliances are are people who are strange bedfellows congress party is leading one alliance called united progressive alliance it doesn't have majority the opposition is led by nda national democratic alliance it also has full of contradictory forces and then there is a third alliance coming from so-called left side where uh, communist party marxists had one position on telangana and cpi has another position and forward block and uh, the, the fourth partner has another position these are three alliances there is no political party today which can command confidence of the country and therefore even if they are elected they have to have some very unholy compromises these strange bedfellows and therefore they have legitimacy problem every government for last 20 years has been subjected to these rumors of abhi gai to abhi gai we said about Atal Bihari Vajpayee government that he was all right but he was always bothered by these three ladies Mamata, Samata and Jalalita because one is coming two are going today Sri Manmohan Singh he keeps on telling that I want to do good for the country but there is some kind of a coalition compulsion so I have to allow loot of the treasury of the country I have to allow Colgate I have to allow scams I have to allow corruption because this is compulsion of coalition if I fight against corrupt people my government will go our position is let your government go but let our country be there you are allowing the government to remain but the country is going this deficit is compounded by a fourth deficit democracy deficit we have become very condescending that democracy has arrived in the country democracy is not only holding elections democracy is not only multi-party system democracy has to go to the doorsteps of ordinary men and women and they should feel empowered that we are the sovereign of the country we are the people who make and change the destiny of the country but ordinary people are feeling very very resourceless they are feeling that we need a patron we need a malik we need a raja to represent us representative democracy is becoming counterproductive today so far as the state apparatus is concerned and these people who get elected they behave like the new rajas when india became free we had around 600 princely states and they were challenged to our democracy and we eliminated them we merged them but now we have in the in the in the shape of new mps and mls 6000 new rajas they think that they are unaccountable to anybody they think that they can be taking the system for a ride and as a result ordinary people after electing me or you next time when i go to refresh my mandate 50 percent of the sitting mlas and mps are defeated 
This is the disenchantment level. But democracy has to grow in party system. Is there any party left in India which has internal democracy? You cannot survive by criticizing your leaders. You have no internal party mechanism of leadership building. Democracy is dying in public spaces. There is growing intolerance between people of different shades of opinion. There is increasing social violence. And in our various forms of life, from family to parliament, the democratic values are on decline. The culture of dialogue is not being promoted. There is some kind of control of all spaces. And this democratic decline or democratic deficit is creating crisis of leadership. We have a good country but very bad leaders. Why? Because the leaders are coming out of primordial bonds. Children of politicians think that they have a birthright to enter into assembly and parliament. And from Rahul Gandhi to Jagan Reddy, I don't want to name them, but look at the quality. They are being forced into politics. Their heart is not there. And when they get into it, they make money left, right and center. They abuse power left, right and center. And they get elected because they are coming from some kind of a lineage of one or the other kind of caste or community or political party. I think except BJP and CPM and maybe CPI, but then they are all very lightweight parties. All other parties are today having a line of succession. Neta and after that Neta's daughter or son or if not son and daughter then son-in-law and daughter-in-law. Sometimes wife. List all major political parties of India and see who is on the first level and who is on the second level. Let us start from Tamil Nadu. DMK. What is the story in DMK? Is a royal battle between brothers and sisters and cousins and uh, uh, nephews and nieces. And from north, uh, south, you come to north, Samajwadi party. What is the story there? One family, eight members of parliament. Uncle, brother, uh, cousin, nephew. You go to Bihar. You go to Kashmir. Is there dearth of political talent in the country? In a country which, where Gandhi was there, who created Nehru, Prasad, Patel, Rajaji, and million other leaders? We have come to this kind of nepotistic politics. This is a deficit of democracy. But there are two more deficits which are much more dangerous, which are related with those four crises of corruption at high places, crony capitalism, centralization, and casteism and communism. And these two deficits are, one is what we call citizenship deficit. In India, in the last 65 years, the idea of India is now taken for granted, like grand old mother and father of the family. Oh, they are already there and they will be there and someday they have to die. I have to take care of my own immediate bond with my wife, my children. So there is explosion of regional political parties. And within national political parties, there is this drive for vote bank politics. So nobody looks at India and the challenge of nation building of India. This idea of nation building is something which is on discount. There are regional aspirations, but what are the national aspirations? And when nation building is not the top project of your politics, then you cannot complain about regionalism, communalism, casteism. There is no interest politics left. There is identity politics and not identity of India, identity of Maithili. Identity of Maratha, identity of Bengali, identity of Sikh, identity of OBC, identity of, uh, you know, X, Y, and Z. So who takes care of India? Like grand old mother, she is sick. She has half a dozen children and three dozen grandchildren. And they all think that the other one will take care of her. So nobody takes her to hospital. Nobody takes her to festival. Nobody takes care of well-being. So is the idea of India. And so the national questions have become communalized. National questions have become regionalized. National questions have become politicized. Ordinary young children hate politics because they think that they are becoming Indian. But they don't see their leaders to be talking Indian. 
they find there is a great disconnect. There is no dialogue between the aspirations of younger India, 21st century India, many of you represent that, and the aspirations of these politicians. In India today, if you can win 10 to 15 members of parliament seat, you can become the destiny maker. You can twist the arms of any major political party and you can move from one to another. Look at the components and constituents of the NDA, Atal Bihari's government. What parties were there? And look at today's UPA. What parties are here? 50% parties are common. They were first with the NDA, now they are with the UPA. And they are all there because of their regional muscle. The idea of nation building has to be brought back to center stage. Only then we can have gender justice. Only then we can have attack on caste-based inequalities. Only when we can have problem about communalism solved much better than what we have today. Only then the problem of regionalism can be addressed. The idea of national interest has to be supreme along with global interest. But today, the difference between India and China is not as sharp as the difference between Karnataka and Tamil Nadu on problem of Kaveri River. The difference between Uttarakhand and Uttar Pradesh is much more sharp than the difference between India and Pakistan on question of what to do with hydroelectric power system. Friends, the last deficit has nothing to do with our politicians. It has nothing to do with multinational corporations. It had nothing to do with crony capitalism. It has to do with you and me, the citizenship deficit. We are becoming citizens by proxy, by default. If you look at the role of ordinary educated men and women of India who are growing by thousands, if not hundreds of thousands over the years, more educated, less socialized. More educated, less law abiding. More educated, less interested in the affairs of the others. The whole middle class of India, which is exploding, they say there are 200 million people who are part of the Indian middle class, roughly speaking. And if you define middle class in terms of their education level, their connectivity, meaning communication, you know, mobile phone, television, radio, their mobility, meaning going around the country, car, scooter, their uh, occupation, meaning doctor, engineer, computer scientist, journalist, lawyers, nurses, uh, financial consultants, the number is growing. But what about the citizenship role? The citizenship duty. Most of them feel proud to inform you and me that, yeah, I don't want to go to vote. How about getting together and having a good long uh, gathering, uh, enjoying ourselves? Kisko vote de? Ye vote is sab neta badmash hain. Kisko vote de? What an excuse. Your walking away is not going to solve the problem. Good people walking away will create a space for bad people or at least incompetent people. But as I said, the citizenship deficit is the most alarming deficit today in our country, which is growing out of those four challenges. And I don't blame middle class people. I come from that class. I know how demoralizing is the scenario. What can I do? Between IRM and Gayaram, whom to choose? Most of these people are connected with real estate mafia. They have a lot of corrupt people in their parties. They don't mean what they have written in manifesto. Why to waste your time and energy and effort is not your, is not your capacity to change the scenario. And you feel frustrated and you get into passivity. Nothing can be done. And this feeling is the most dangerous feeling. If you want to negotiate future, your future, your children's future, your country's future, you have to realize and believe that I can make the difference. The buck will stop at my table. I will say that this is right and this is wrong. And this is how it started with Gandhi and Patel and much before that, Lala Lajpat Rai and uh, 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 Bal Ganga Dartilak and Justice Ranaday and uh, many others. They said, we will fight for freedom. Freedom is my birthright and I shall have it. Similarly, if middle class of India says that democracy is our heritage and we will make it survive and grow and this country deserves to be better and we will make it better, 
and I'll start with, from myself, then things can be different. And that deficit cannot be covered by any management expert. Any new model of development and growth and investment and input and output, technology revolution, information revolution, green revolution, white revolution, you can have all of this. And still if there is citizenship deficit, and if the idea of India is discounted, then there is really a very disappointing situation. Fragmentation, ethnicization, identity politics. And this is where Aam Admi Party comes into a very significant contribution. The days are going to be over that sub chalta hai. And we'll start from the top. We will go for the accountability of the Prime Minister and President and the Chief Justice and the Chief Minister. Then we will take care of the local Thanedar and local Gram Panchayat Mukhya and the local BDO or the local Babu or local Lala. And this has started with a spirit of selflessness. There is no personal grievance of the people who are protesting against the crisis and the challenge of democracy. They are only saying that we don't like it. We cannot live with more of the same. We have to change it. And my friend Arvind Kejriwal generally starts or concludes his public meetings with this uh, uh, very inspiring and at the same time very alarming poem of uh, Dushyant Kumar. Ho gai hai peer parvasi pigalni chahiye. Is Himalaya se koi ganga nikalni chahiye. Mere sine mein nahi, tere sine mein sahi. Ho kahi bhi aag, lekin aag jalni chahiye. This spirit is now getting crystallized. And people are gathering together. No more suffering in silence. No more putting political and bureaucratic and economic disasters into zone of benign neglect. Talking about it openly and thinking constructively. Aam Admi Party has emerged out of this revolution of rising frustrations. They have started with hope that maybe that these are innocent saints who are sitting in assembly and parliament, they don't know what is wrong. One big thing is that in our system, you can catch the corrupt, but you cannot punish the corrupt. Unlike the Chinese system, where they are hanged publicly. Unlike the Japanese system, where prime minister and finance minister have died in prison because they have done embezzlement. Unlike the American system, where the banks and the corporations have been taken head on by the country and they have been put in some kind of a spot. In our case, you can have CBI cases and you can also become ministers. You can become chief ministers. In our case, if Aam Admi Party has pointed out to somebody as someone who is doing mistake and wrong things, what a strange paradox that they get promoted. There was a gentleman who was found to be pocketing money in the name of development work. And when we said inquire about him, he was promoted to become much superior minister. There was another gentleman who was running the affairs of the economy for a couple of years. We said under his leadership and patronage, there has been a scam after a scam. He got promoted to the topmost position of the republic. I don't want to name the position. You can make your guess. There are other people who are CBI cases, who have dozens and dozens of CBI cases, and they are there sitting next to the prime minister in the important dinners and gatherings. What kind of message you are sending to the country? It's very dangerous situation. But when danger is there, some people have to come forward. And I'm very proud to report to you. In fact, I don't have to report to you because these are days of information connectivity. You know much more than I do. Because I'm not really having much of uh, what you call uh, inclination and time. I think that I know a few things because I read newspapers in India every morning. But you are too far away, so you really go into many channels. And there are all these new methods of Twitter and Facebook and many other things. You cannot hide the 
uh, the truth and the facts so you know it better that there is this emergence of nationwide protest, not nationwide only, national and international level protest about corruption at high places. And this wave has started two years ago from Ramlila ground. It started as little, little streams of unrest in various parts of the country for the last 10 to 15 years. Millions of movements have taken place, which we as Naipaul call million mutinies now in his uh, understanding of India in the late 90s. It has all now merged into a great new stream of consciousness, conviction and courage. If you want me to ask the essence of Aam Admi Party, I will not say that it has a mega plan. I will not say that it has clarity of concepts, but it has three other virtues which are very promising. One, they have the courage of truth. Second, they have consistency of action. One step, second step, third step, fourth step, no matter what. They started with hope and they ended in hopelessness. They went to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister made a five-member committee from his side and five members from movement side and the bill was created. Bill was put in Parliament, Rajya Sabha, Lok Sabha approved it. Then Rajya Sabha, they backtracked. So you can see this kind of uh, hope and hopelessness. And then the third thing, they have creativity. They are not doing routine politics. Jindabad, Murdabad, FEG burning. They are looking into the system. And they are trying to think about systemic solutions. Jan Lokpal bill was one systemic solution. Today, we realize that no. There is a conspiracy of silence. Most of the political parties have to lose a lot. And over and above the political elite's problems, there is this corporate elite, which is living and thriving with what we call parallel economy. Some people call it black economy. I think black is beautiful, but this is very ugly. Let us not call it black economy, it's parallel economy. They have their own sovereign, they have their own system. They call it hawala, they call it smuggling. They call it many other names and it's a global disease and it has grown disproportionately with liberalization. The scale has changed. One prime minister lost his chair because of the problem of 64 crore rupees, right? Today, we have stories of 64,000 crore rupees and not an inch of change in the capacity of ordinary people to change the regime because it's a global network. The players have changed. They are no more within the national frontiers. And Tata calls it crony capitalism. Maoists call it semi-colonial, semi-feudal economy. And I, you, and I and you call it a deficit democracy. So Aam Admi Party has been created with three agenda. First, to present the reality before the people of India and ask their energy and wisdom to be pulled together to create a new agenda for India. The social contract which was made between people and politicians of India during the freedom struggle is over. Politicians are no more accountable, responsible or respectful to the ordinary people. This is a dangerous situation. We need new kind of politics. So change the political culture and make it citizen-centric. At the moment, at best, it is caste-centric. But it has to be citizen-centric. And that has to be done by getting back into politics. Politics is 90% mobilization and 10% representation. Politics is cultivating awareness about your rights and duties. And politics has become a dirty word. So Aam Admi Party, is dreaming of a day when people become proud to say that I love politics as it was during the freedom struggle. That people came to become IES, ICS and lawyers in England and they returned radicalized. Nehru, Subhash Bose, Jayaprakash, Lohia, lot of communists, lot of socialists, lot of nationalists. And they said politics is Yuga Dharma. It's time to die for the nation. 
or at least do for the nation. We have to do that. Bring politics within the menu, within the agenda, within the purpose of our life. But what is politics? Grabbing power? No. Politics is art and science of nation building. Art and science of cultivating goodness. If Gandhi was not doing politics, all his spiritual assets and powers would have been nearly insignificant. It was politics which made people think collectively beyond their own individual or caste or communal sorrows and joys. That kind of politics has to be brought back into our imagination, particularly for 21st century Indians. Not for the dying Indians, but for the growing Indians. And we cannot live with this excuse that in the time of Jayaprakash Narayan there was a change, but what happened? We went from bad to worse. We cannot have this excuse that the left front failed in West Bengal and therefore there is no hope for any kind of economic and social and political justice for the masses. We cannot say that politics of nationalism represented by NDA had its own failures and deficits. We have to bring it all back into new consideration and new chemistry. The second thing is to create a new set of goals for India of 21st century. It cannot be one political party. And that's where I have to tell you about four E's. Where no political party, including Aam Admi Party, can be confidently saying that we know the solutions. And unless you have solutions for, for those emerging challenges, India's future is going to become much darker. And you know about those four emer emerging challenges because you are experiencing it. You are here because of those emerging challenges. You are victim of some of those challenges. One of them has been just underlined by all of us through 15 days of fast of National Convener of Aam Admi Party, Sherwin Kejriwal, Bijli Parni. Actually, it is energy question. India is an energy deficit country. It cannot live with imported and borrowed credit and credibility through oil and gas, through political manipulations. We have to think about a new combination of energy sources, starting with solar energy and coming up to nuclear energy. We cannot hope that just by signing nuclear energy deals with America, we have solved the problem. We have to have hydro energy. We have to cultivate. You, you go around this country and you see wind, wind, windmills all over Europe. They are doing a lot of work on solar energy. Suraj Bhagwan is not very happy with the northern countries. He remains absent on Lien or sabbatical for seven months of the year. In India, the tropical countries, they are blessed by sunrise and sun energy. But where are we going? We say that we will get gas from Iran and then you'll cook your bread. We say that we will have more concessions from oil countries and so your car will be running a little more cheaper. But this is a dead end. Energy question has to be solved. India has all the talent, all the capital, all the capacity, but we are having a big deficit of energy. And there is no easy solution. We have to think about it. Fresh. We need new talent. We need new thinking, out of the box solutions. The second emerging challenge is of employment. We had wonderful story of growth in the last 20 years, right? But it was jobless growth. It was capital intensive growth. And it created disparities. It created radicalization of the poor. It created some kind of growing disbalance between rural and the urban. There was negative growth in agriculture. There was positive growth in service sector. 12% growth. And in agriculture, it was minus 3% for 3-4 years continuously. In a land where 60-65% to people are dependent upon agriculture and related ancillary activities. Jobless growth creates deep divisions in nation. The nation building project cannot go on with jobless growth model. When you have economic inequality within a family, 
children born out of the same par parents, they start fighting with each other. What to talk of a country? North and South, split on caste and religious lines. This jobless growth is employment question. How to have productive employment, not sarkari employment, where you are subsidizing and hiding poverty. There is some initiative, but that initiative has run into trouble. Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act is only for rural India, whereas 35 percent people are urban India, and poverty is growing more in urban India than in rural India. People are migrating out of the pockets of poverty from rural India. Employment. What is the third emerging crisis and challenge? I told you about energy. I told you about employment. But education system. Education is the greatest leveler. It is the most silent revolutionary process. You give education to a family of uneducated, illiterate Dalit, and within no time there will be Baba Sahib Ambedkar. And many millions of men and women have enjoyed this freedom because of power of knowledge. They had no land. They had no property. But they got education subsidized by our freedom and subsidized by our democratic country. And today many of you, most of you sitting here are blessed children, daughters and sons of that education system. But there are many more who did not get that opportunity. Think about your primary school friends. How many could come to high school? Think about high school friends, how many could come to college and think about college friends, how many of could go to science and technology and medicine and agriculture and management and computer sciences. Very narrow entry point into the high levels of education, which creates problems for children of rural areas because of this English and non-English background. A Tamil speaking uh, child is no less brilliant than an English educated child. But just because he or she is not very articulate in this power of language of English, entry into Indian Institute of Medical Science, IIT, and many other universities is very difficult. And then all those who are living with illiteracy, what is their condition? They are neither here nor there. They are supposed to be citizen of India, sovereign of India, but their information system their skills, their capabilities, as Professor Amartya Sen will argue, they have capability deficit. They have freedom deficit. And this education system of India, after 65 years, we have recognized education as a fundamental right. But look at the provisions, what have we created for them in the last three to four years. Very limited resources are available to make our education system state of the art system. And that's where we have a competition with our neighborly civilization country called China. Look at the Chinese within their own country and around the world. They are far ahead of us and they are brutally frank about the need of putting education as one of the top agendas apart from health and nutrition for their citizens. And here we have an attitude of benign neglect. We did impose a middle class cess for education. So there is some more money out there. But there is much more commercialization of education. There is much more inequality at the level of primary and secondary education. And we have to work on it. What is the fourth one? The problem of environment. Even if you have energy, employment, and education, environment of India has been attacked by us left, right, and center, by the industrialists, by the middle classes, by the bureaucrats, by the politicians, the water level is going down and getting polluted. The quality of air, the quality of our soil is getting regressive. Punjab, the, the granary of India is having declining productivity because there is saturation of the soil with chemical fertilization and we are talking about need to go back to organic agriculture. How difficult it is, you all know. Waste management. We have beautiful cities, but look at the ugly side, which has become topic of Hollywood films, slumdog millionaire kind of films. They have become shame for us, but we cannot ignore it. 
we don't know how to uh, dispose our waste most of the cities from delhi to uh, mumbai and bangalore they, they have to learn a few things if you look at countries like america how they have changed look at europeans how they have learned what to do with their waste management and environment is not only reforestation environment is not only you know uh, moving from uh, sulfur based uh, fuel to uh, cng fuel environment is also managing water resources the water crisis the land crisis the ecological crisis is asking us to make some hard choices so energy employment education and environment these are four areas which require 21st century thinking we cannot go back we can have some learning from the masters in terms of the values but we cannot have the details from them whether you read hind swaraj or discovery of india or communist manifesto or books of uh, dindyal upadhyay and jayaprakash narayan and everybody put together these are 21st century challenges we had warning from our founding fathers and mothers we did not listen to them now the time has come to listen to the warnings think of fresh and that's where again aam aadmi party is trying to create the second uh, input that is trying to create an agenda for india a new agenda for india for 21st century we have established 30 expert committees we have requested the experts that we don't want you to become member of aam aadmi party we don't want to make you our ideologues we respect your individuality your expertise your neutrality or your independence but we want to borrow from you your knowledge please tell us what to do about education employment health agriculture industry liberalization social justice and we hope to put it all together in next 2 to 3 months time i'm very happy to inform you that the country is not only hungry for new ideas but the experts are also hungry to get together with others to do their bit and lot of good people are now working day and night in last 6 to 7 weeks and hopefully in another 6 to 7 weeks we'll have some results the third thing we are trying to create is a new political culture meaning that democracy should be practiced in democratic parties and there we are going to go again back to the old classical successful model where the local unit was full of local members and they will be making choices for who will be the candidate in the next election and this candidate will be responsible for the local area and then there will be local participation they will not only give their vote but they will also provide resources and this process is generally not acceptable to any political party because then what is the value of high command what will happen to this politics of ganesh parikrama and what will happen to politics of vote bank today no matter who is the candidate if he or she belongs to my caste then the other candidates are totally negligible no matter how good he or she may be and that's why very good candidates are losing their deposit and very ugly candidates are winning again and again and making our political system polluted friends this afternoon i am trying to present before you the four challenges as we perceive corruption at high places crony capitalism in the name of liberalization and globalization centralization in the name of democracy and casteist and communal politics in the name of identity politics and so called multi party politics this has created six deficits development deficit which is written on the face of india 45% of all indians are suffering with malnutrition we are a country with one of the highest rates of infant mortality and maternal mortality we are a country with a very large number of illiterate people and below poverty line people and these are all figures coming not from aam aadmi party 
is coming from government of India, planning commission, United Nations, all those so-called, uh, you know, positive pro-system agencies. And if you want to check it, look at these four commissions. Arjun Sen Gupta Committee Report, which says that 77% of the working population of India has their purchasing power of 20 rupees per day. And I told it to some of my friends that in your country, one cookie costs you one dollar. And in my country, 40% people have purchasing power of buying only probably half a cookie. What about rest of the food? Then there is this committee of Bandopadhyay, which says that extremism is growing in the country because of this deficit of governance. Bad governance is forcing people to lose their trust in peaceful methods. Then there is this committee which says that the minorities are suffering very radical downward mobility. Many people think that, oh, in the name of secularism, minorities have been given a free run. Is the other way around? Their representation in assembly, parliament, bureaucracy, business, education. You look around and see what is the level of diversity and you'll feel disappointed. And then the most threatening report is about declining gender ratio. In the progressive part of India, Punjab, Haryana, Western UP has become the fields of murdering daughters. So the gender ratio, 1000 to 933. There is a growing bride market. People are becoming more and more vulnerable. And this cruelty against women is one of the undying tragedies of our gender deficit. So I tried to tell you about these six deficits of development, governance, legitimacy, democracy, nation building, and citizenship. And then four emerging crises. Energy question needs out-of-box solution. No import liberalization, no subsidy, no, no matter what you do, there'll be always some kind of bad equation. Second is employment question. Jobless growth in last 20 years has created much disenchantment. Government had to come with this manurega, which has been suggested as only banded on some kind of a deep deficit because this economy doesn't have the capacity of generating mass employment. And some of you are victim of that policy. You have to run out of your country for your shelter, your security. You want to go back, but openings are very few. Employment policy. And the third, very important, education system. If you want to destroy a country, destroy its education system. If you want to build a country, invest in its education system. Within five to 15 years, Investing in education changes face of a family, face of a community, face of a nation. And our attitude towards education system is fairly strange. We have become a country which is making profit out of education also. Making profit out of education and health is the biggest sin you can think of. We are a country of Tagore and Malviya, Sir Sayyid Ahmad and Zakir Hussain, where education was supposed to be an enlightening process. And it did prove all right. But today education is nobody's, nobody's baby and everybody's business. All failed politicians are creating colleges and universities. All bad governments are using corruption, uh, using education as a method of corruption. And no accountability about the quality of education in, public, uh, in government schools. In a country which had the commitment to provide free compulsory common education to all children up to 14 years of age within first 10 years of freedom. And then the fourth question of environment is not global warming, it's actually drinking water problem. It's the sinking level of our economic sustainability. You can have money to create a factory, but the city has become choked. You cannot have any more investment there. And the new norms and new laws are being, uh, in a way, circumvented in places like Orissa and making people rebels. And here we have an initiative. 
There are people who ask about the question of viability. When we moved in the direction of creating a political party, and that's my last point, and then I want to come to question answer, and I don't know why my friend forgot to give me my uh, five minutes slip. I had said that when I approached 25 minutes, he had given me 30 minutes, and I'm sorry for those who are listening from various places. My apologies on behalf of myself and Aam Admi Party, but the question is so big and so large that I beg to get another five minutes from you to tell you what we have done in last two years. When we started protesting against corruption, they said you have to love with it. Capitalism and corruption are twins. And we said, no, it is not true. You can have clean business houses. You can have clean capitalist system. Because communism and corruption are also looking like twins. If you know the stories of Soviet Union and China. and So corruption is not necessarily a disease of capitalism and a virtue of uh, socialism, communism, and can be the other way around also. A clean uh, capitalist can be a great success story. Then they said, oh, but you know, how can you do it? Japrakash Narayan's movement did not do it. How can you do it? We said, make a Jan Lokpal bill. And it will require only a small change in your system of investigation. Make CBI free of Home Minister and Prime Minister and bring in Prime Minister also within the orbit of inquiry. And I think the story will be uh, a little better. They said, all right, looks all right. And we'll make a committee. They made a committee of five genius from their side and five uh, good people from our side and our side was not only really represented by a mass leader and conscience of the country like Anna Hajar, it also included one of the top most legal minds of our time, Sri Shanti Bhushan, former law minister of India, one of the best lawyers of democratic struggles, Sri Prashant Bhushan, one of the best government servants ever and one of the best students of IIT ever produced, Sri Arvind Kejriwal and, and then Jesse Santosh Hekde, who is paying for the corrupt people, be, be it Congress or be it uh, BJP. A great Lokpal from Karnataka, and we had North, South, East, West together. They said, all right, we are going together. They created a consensus for a draft. And then they betrayed us. And there's no explanation why they did it. Sri Rahul Gandhi spoke on the floor of the parliament that we have to make a fundamental change in the paradigm. But today he is silent. Maybe he has gone into Mount Brother. But we cannot keep silent. So we went again back to the street and asked the people, what next? They said, get into politics because they are saying that lawmaking is the responsibility of those who are elected by the people. And election is a very important process and we respect it. It's a constitutional right and we have earned it. India did not get the right to vote on a platter. We fought it inch by inch from 1905 to 1937, to 1947, then 1950. And Indian women are proud. They got right to vote much before Swiss women and much earlier than the British women. So they said that go to election and create a political party. They said creating political party is an important responsible duty. You cannot do it, you middle class people. You will go away. You are all created out of OB vans. Media has generated you. He said, fine, we'll create a political party. We took our own time because to create a political party in a land of political parties is very difficult. Because there are political parties based on ideology, there are political parties based on caste, religion, region. So where is the space for a new political party? We said, political party on the basis of a new dream of a better democracy, participatory democracy. And it took long time because we had our own in-house confusion and debate and creative dialogue. And then after good preparation on 26 November, we launched a party. Today we are nearly six months old. And we are very proud to inform you that we are not only a growing family of such people who are coming into politics to offer something, asking the question that what can I do for the country and the party? Rather than asking the other way, what this party will give it to me? If this party will give me ticket, I am here. If this party will not give me ticket, I go to there. As if parties are shops. And finally, we have also started changing the agenda of political parties. Water and electricity 
has emerged as common denominator of disconnect between ordinary people and the system. Elite is one who has all water and electricity from toilet to bedroom and masters are those who have limited water and electricity. And now other political parties are also talking about what to do with water and electricity problem. Otherwise they were talking about reservation. Whose reservation to be increased? Whose reservation to be decreased? They were talking about special packages. Give package to Kashmir, give package to Bihar, give package to Arunachal. Now everybody is talking about these twin problems of our life with dignity and survival. Drinking water, irrigation water, electricity for home, electricity for hospital, electricity for laboratory, electricity for industry. And what is the project? What is the roadmap? Friends, we are now a group which has arrived. And now we want to make a major impact in culture of election by fighting the Vidhan Sabha election of Delhi on the basis of ordinary people working in their blocks, in their polling booths. We have time and we have volunteers. At least 100, 100, 10, 100,000, that's lakh, 1 million people. In last 65 years of Delhi politics, never before 1 million people signed on any common cause. You may have mobilized them on Mandir Masjid. You may have mobilized them on the question of reservation or anti-reservation, but not on Bijli and Pani. It's for the first time that Aam Admi Party has succeeded in changing the discourse of democratic competition. But you have to contribute now. Contribute to look at those four emerging E's. Contribute to think about six deficits, particularly citizenship deficit, and contribute to make this idea of Aam Admi Party a reality so that we change the basic slogan of Indian politics from Desh ka neta kaisa ho, unke jaisa ho. Balki Desh ka neta kaisa ho, Aam Admi jaisa ho. Common people like leader. Gandhi, if you did not tell who is he, will be considered by a foreigner as somebody who is a peasant out there. Isn't it? He looked like a grand old uh, member of the family in his lifestyle. Many of the other people change themselves in their bhasha, in their bhusha, in their bhojan, in their bhavan to acclimatize with ordinary people. Today there is a competition to look superior and superior and superior. Even their shoes are in white color. They fly around in helicopters and chartered planes. They are no ordinary people and they are thinking that they are neta. Neta in democracy is one who is closest to the people. And this is where I want to stop. I want to invite you for your questions, your criticism, your comment, and above and all, your commitment. Thank you very much. So, whoever has a question, yeah, just stand up, introduce yourself in whatever way you want, and then pose your question and be loud enough so that the computer mic can catch you. If you want to step forward, that's yeah, yeah, sure. Hi, my name is uh, Himan. Uh, I've, I recently got involved uh, with, uh, with Aam Aadmi Party Chicago. And my question to you is, a um, couple of weeks ago I was having a conversation with my uncle who was, uh, who was, who was, who has been active with Congress and then he was active with BJP. Um, and so I was, I was, um, I was uh, telling him about Amatmi Party and getting getting him involved with him. Um, he came back to me and said, "All parties, including Congress and BJP, were started by great people and um, had great agenda, and so does Amatmi Party. It will start with great agenda, and it will start. It is being started by great people." But how will how will it sustain? How will it sustain as a great party? What is so different about this party? And I was not able to answer it. I think that's a very important question because not only in India, around the world, uh, parties lose their uh, idealism with growth. Sometimes because of power, they become pragmatic in face of defeat. But the biggest problem 
in the declining level of virtues in any political party is when you become pragmatic about your own people who are your party members or leaders and their mistakes. You say, apna admi hai, isko chodo. Ghar ki baat hai, samne matla. And it starts sliding down. We have started with the check called our own internal lokpal. And these are people who are going to be people of substance, not party members, and who can be approached about the acts of omission and commission by of Aam Admi Party in near future. And they can receive complaints from party members, from others, maybe opposition party members, even anonymous letter with enough substance. And then we will be investigating. And then we will also be honoring the judgment or recommendation of the internal Lokpa. So that from the very first day, we remain committed. Not only committed, but also remain controlled. Committed internally and controlled by the environment to walk a straight line. And we hope that this will work. Second, many parties have been polluted in search of vote, in search of winability. We think that participating in election is important. But winning election at any cost is very dangerous. So we like to participate in election on the basis of internal democracy and make the country move towards participatory democracy so that we are not dependent upon our MLA, MP, uh, Panchayat Mukhya. We are dependent upon the voters first and other people later. And that's why we will like to have this kind of uh, dialogue or dialectics between voter and the representative and make it as participatory as possible. These are two precautions we are trying to build and we have within our control first precaution, internal cleanliness, continuous watchdog job. And second, participating in election in a different way, not on the basis of money power or vote bank politics and not participating to win at any cost, but participate to make a, an agenda, make a point. Let us see with this kind of doubting seniors, I think we will be able to meet part of our responsibility. We want the country to be very vigilant and we want the country to be asking again and again, thousand times about cleanliness of people who, who are representing us. And this is where Ahmad party welcomes such doubting uh, Democrats and we want their active uh, Vigilance, active cooperation. Thank you. I have, yes. I have one more question. Yeah, yes, please. So I think let's give oh. everybody a chance of... Yes, okay. please. Yes. 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 My name is Kallol Guha. I'm living, yes, uh, I'm living outside India since 1970s. And I would like to mention this, that in 1973, I remember that Harkishan Singh Surjit, who used to be a boss of CPIM, he came to Copenhagen when we were students there. And he gave a speech about the general condition of India. And he said exactly the same thing as you are saying, all the problems. Uh, and today, after nearly 40 years, what you are saying is very similar to what he said, which means in 40 years, the problems of India has not changed very much. However, there is one very interesting point that I note, that in your speech, you um, emphasize one part, and that is education. As it is known very well that any country that wants to subjugate or uh, destroy another country, colonize another country, one of the first thing they do, they destroy the culture, they, the language, culture, and the heritage. And as it is known, then uh, during the Second World War, when Hitler um, attacked, before they attacked Poland, this was the uh, recipe they, they used. It was the same with Russia. So now, as you see, the Indian um, languages, culture, and heritage is being destroyed by the infiltration of the West, the, the Pashtim, the Pashtun's culture, language, etc., it is destroying, and the national language, the national culture, and the heritage is being rooted out. In these 40 years, this is the first time that I am hearing that a political party member is emphasizing on the importance of education and the importance of using, linking the indigenous language and the culture together with education. So this sounds promising. 
in my opinion. However, in conclusion, I would like to emphasize one point. This is a new party with very promising ideas and strategies. But in this connection, I would like to emphasize this uh, statement of um, Anna Hazare. I heard him saying in one of the interviews that what Arvind Kejriwal's strategy, he doesn't agree. It is because you, ha you, sh you should not antagonize all the powerful enemies at the same time. You should catch them one at a time. And I think that in, in this regard, I would like to get your opinion. Is it so that Ahmadli party, by attacking the big industrialists like Reliance and then all the ministers of Congress, ministers of uh, BJP, they're attacking all of them at the same time. And as a result, it is also obvious that uh, uh, there was a press blackout. So is this a good strategy? or you are thinking of changing this strategy? I think this is a very important question and maybe in many of your minds. The general democratic strategy of success is to isolate the main adversary and create alliances of short term, mid term, long term with the others and then you know dish them one by one. There was a strategy of Hitler, Stalin, Jawaharlal Nehru, many others. But uh, the problem of lesser evil as acceptable has brought us where we are today. For the left parties, anybody but uh, Bharati Janta Party and its allies. For Bharati Janta Party, anybody but Congress and the Communists. For Congress, nobody but us and us only, Nehru Gandhi Parivar. I think we have to think about it in holistic manner. And we have to see where we are headed. We need clarity and we need specificity of the details. Our problem was that when we started the protest, it was suggested to be RSS gay. Manmohan Singh Ji, such a charming grandfather-like intellectual professorial, first professor in the history of India who became prime minister. And he remains clean, relatively speaking, you know, you look at his dress, his demeanor, his property, you cannot blame him to be making money on the left and the right and the side uh, in the accounts of uh, family members. But we were not RSS game. When we entered the process, we realized that there is also problem with other alternatives. And we talked about Sri Nitinji Gadkari, the former president of BJP. When we got the facts, then it was suggested that this is the Congress game to divide the opposition vote. BJP would have been lesser evil. You should have waited till the election and controlled them. Maybe they could have given you a few tickets and then there would have been a new start. But BJP is no more politic party with the difference with the Europas and, 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 and many others. I don't want to name them, why to waste your time and my time. Then they said it's Congress game to divide the opposition vote. But all political parties also started blaming us that this is a corporate game to depoliticize us. If you say that all political parties are playing wrong game, that means you are rejecting the political leadership who are mandated by the people who are coming to election and contesting and winning or losing. You are not criticizing the corporates. Whereas corporates have much more capacity and power and opportunity and reason to continue the process of corruption. Politicians are elected for five years. Corporates are there for 50 years, maybe 100 years. So when we talked about so-called parallel economy and named people with their account number, including the two Ambani brothers, and when we said that Ambani brothers are not only with Congress, they're also with BJP, what happened in Gujarat with the gas connections, they said, oh, they are not Congress game, they are not BJP game, they are attacking corporate, they are radical leftists. Some others said this is the foreign game. India is the emerging star. China is nervous. America is jealous. Of course, Pakistan and Nepal and Indonesia, Malaysia, this elephant is now walking. So foreign agencies are promoting this, what you call an atmosphere of cynicism. Politicians are bad. Corporate are bad, 
Only these people are good. He said, no. We are not good. But we have to tell you the total disease. If you have come to us and ask us what is wrong with the situation, like a genuine pathologist, we have to give you the total report. Yes, you look pretty. You look handsome, Mr. Shah Rukh Khan and Miss Katerina Kaif, but your system, your liver is bad, your heart is bad, your mind is bad. What can we do? You have to go for total therapy, total cure. Our corporate are not socially responsible. Our politicians are not constitutionally committed. And we have to change both. We are not saying that we will start ourselves. We are saying we have to change the institutions. We have to change the processes. So our strategy is a strategy of awareness building. Making people alert that becoming non-political is no solution. Trusting the corporate is no solution. Moving from NDA to BJ, uh, UPA, UPA to NDA and in between left front or regional parties is no solution. Solution is clean politics. Solution is clean money. Yes, capital must have the right to create its own profit space, but through right ways, not wrong ways. Similarly, politicians must be respected, but only if they are committed to constitution and for the people, and not for their party and their neta and their biradri. Yes. Yeah, I appreciate all of you. But uh, one, uh, one specific question I want to ask you is that the, uh, when the election process in India itself is a completely tough, how do you think you can have a progress in your own growth? It can be an uh, organization where you come into power. See, I have to tell you, with due reverence to uh, your observation, that this system has a very paradoxical character. You and me are saying that this is really bad and you are not wrong. But it's like a glass which is half full and half empty. I'm looking at the empty part, you are looking at the empty part. As I said, money power, media power, uh, criminals getting into it. But there are other people who are saying that even this amount of water is okay for me. Look at those who are asking for more engagement in the present system. There is a vibrant women movement which is growing in leaps and bounds, which is asking for 30% reservation in the present parliamentary setup. They said we will come. We know how to keep a good house and clean a dirty home. You just allow us. There are too many women, not too many men in politics for too long. 90% of the parliament is occupied by men. Since 1952, Jawaharlal Nehru ji, Indira ji, Rajiv ji, Atal ji, all the ji's together and no space for women. Then look at the Dalits. They said, you, you are saying this is the dirty system. For us, it is so far in the memory of our generations most emancipatory. This parliament is making laws and giving us protection in such a way which is very, very uh, uh, you can say, uh, in a way, soothing for us is not everything which we want to have. But at least Constitution of India, Parliament of India is unanimous about no untouchability, no caste discrimination. Then the minorities, they are saying that this Constitution, this Parliament has given us much better. Over the years, we have now Minorities Commission. We have a variety of protections by this Parliament. So you have this problem of, you know, limited good and limited bad. But my problem or Aam Admi problem is that this limited good is declining by the day. Even from the minorities, from the Dalits, from the women sector, rather unacceptable elements are emerging. And that is dirty. There is more and more Robin Hood syndrome which is being utilized. So we have to check it. So I will not go that far that our system is totally rotten. If you go to Pakistani democratic dialogue, they say that yaar kisi tarah se humare yaan bhi tumhare tarikhe se ho jata ki vote ke jariye jara mamla sulat jata jab musharraf power mein hai to Nawaz Sharif or Benazir Bhutto videsh mein hai ya jail mein hai. Jab wo power se utarta hai, to wo jail mein chala jata hai. Or 
multi party system nepal after victory of maoists in nepal they are trying to create a multi party system freedom of media china has done all great things but to create diversity based polity is still china's distant dream they cannot live with freedom of press they cannot live with multi party system so i will not say that all 65 years have gone waste what i am saying is that the present situation is a turning point if we start this drift of the democratic system towards the dominant caste democracy we will be paying very dearly we are only minimal democracy we can become maximum democracy provided the citizenship gets it the first entry point me and you is addressed as the top priority then others can be taken care of yes please you and then i think you should try to answer the minimum minimum please sure sure hi sir i am shivan from first year graduate student here and go close to the mic yeah i think sure I'm Shiva. I'm a first-year graduate student here in applied mechanics. I had a particular question. In the event of not getting a majority in 2014 elections, what coalition options are you looking at? Very good question. <laughs> uh, we have this uh, model before us about Green Party in Europe. They had three level of engagement in the political system. First was a claim of your vote. in order to change the government the second was a claim of your attention to change the agenda of politics we may win or lose but those who are in power are forced to pay attention to environmental destruction and third was that maybe that we are not able to change the government and make our own government change the agenda and make our own agenda acceptable as basic common denominator then at least create a movement for environmental awareness and they started with the third one they did not get lot of votes in the first round of elections they did not create a same environmental policy but they enlarged the movement remember that we are born out of the compulsion of parliamentary democracy where movement was brought to a kind of a plateau like situation that go for another hunger strike will not care will lie to the nation will not respond to you come to election do politics so we are walking on two legs mobilization for election and election for mobilization and i think that first thing will be there so far as getting into government is concerned we don't think that more of the same will be okay so we will not like to get into a coalitions with these parties who fundamentally disagree with us on question of these deficits or questions of these challenges we would like to then go back to the people you voted us 10% please you should have voted us 33% or 51% and we will wait for the next 5 years because this is a generational transformation process and we have to have that patience so as i said mobilization will be much more accelerated maybe agenda is acceptable the ideal will be if the whole country wakes up and we create a majority in the parliament but we will not go for pragmatic opportunistic solutions where we get some ministerial post but we miss and we get the trees but we miss the jungle no we will not do that and then man da Uh, my name is Forrest Dadaboy, and uh, I belong to an organization called India Development Coalition of America. We've been working on the four problems, the four E's that you have been talking about Thank for the you. last ten years. Great. Uh, your number one problem, you, you, at least number one challenge, you said was corruption in high places. Uh, today in India. and pakistan comparing the two countries in pakistan only 5% of the population pays income tax 0.5% of the population pays income tax the big zamindars don't in india today only 2.7% of the population pays income tax 54% of the money collected is collected from federal income tax 
the state makes up 46% of the income tax. Out of the state, according to Arvind Kejriwal in his book, and I've read his whole book. Thank you. Indicates that an average family in the Gram Sabha or the village level contributes 300 rupees as taxes in indirect, indirect, indirect taxes, indirect taxes. Sales taxes and other taxes. 300 rupees in one year. Now, for 300 rupees, which is six dollars, say he has five or six family members, he has one dollar per person contribution to the government. Now, you expect the government to provide education, guard the borders, uh, provide health care for yeah, one dollar. Many other it's, public, it's, it's very public utilities. It's very difficult. The people in India have a problem. And let me tell you what I see as the number one problem. The number one problem in India is greed. It is financial greed. The people in India don't want to pay taxes. They want to pay minimum taxes. Half the government and the people run on black money. $1.5 billion or more is in Swiss accounts. Real estate is bought with black money. Half the transactions in the country are black money. The people are greedy. They don't want, they want to keep the money for themselves. So this greed is inherent in the population. This greed is showing up with the politicians and the politicians are coming from the people. And they are becoming greedy and taking bribes. Corporations are doing it. Contractors are doing it. It's a greed culture. It's greed that's driving this. Now, if we look at the Indians from our country who have come here, let me just give you three examples of greed. Rajat Gupta, the number one face of IIT in the United States, was found guilty for insider trading. Federation of India Association, which is based in Chicago, three of its members tried to buy the seat of Senator Obama and tried to finance Jesse Jackson Jr. These are three members of 40 Indian associations who are motivated by greed. Dr. Desai in Florida today, in the last he runs universal health care, the FBI raided his offices and he has disappeared. He runs universal health care. These are people who are making thousands and millions of dollars and all they have come from India and they are motivated by greed. India's number one problem is greed. The lower level, the middle class, government employees, they are paid so little money, 700 rupees to 7,000 rupees a month. You can support one person, but you cannot support a family. So if they have to live and support their family, they have to take bribes. This is the system created by greed. Unless India solves its individual heart throbbing problem, moral value of greed, I don't see the country progressing. As far as civic education, I am on a committee and I am a member of a group called Citizens Advocacy Center. And we have introduced civic education in the state of Illinois. It has been passed and it is being progressed in our assembly. Civic education is needed, morals are needed, absence of greed is needed. Only then will India continue to provide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Actually, uh, you know, the, the, the idea, uh, hold on, please, hold on, please, hold on, please. Uh, the idea of greed is something which is supposed to be great motivator for all people. It will be difficult to say that Indians are greedy more than the Chinese or the Russians or the Americans or the British or the French. It is greed which makes them go an extra mile. Not only according to me and you, but also from Adam Smith to Max Weber. So I'll only agree with you that far, that people who have the capacity to do good are compromising their role and duty 
because of this greed factor. Second, the idea of teaching morals is inferior to the idea of practicing morals. There's a crisis of role models. More rich is playing more unfair. And uh, not me or you, a great spiritual master Swami Vivekananda suggested that the God of the poor lives in roti and not in temple and mosque. And most of the people in the country realize that greed is pain. If you have black money, you have extra money, as I said, money power, then you have not only a good house, a good business, also you can become parliamentarian. You can probably become minister. Money power has become a very serious challenge over moral power in country of Gautam and Gandhi. But, yeah, but at the moment, there are certain institutional bottlenecks. It is actually true that Indian revenue system requires some check, some review. And we expected that in the last 20 years, there would be some liberalization and some kind of rationalization of the tax system. But unfortunately, in these 20 years, there has been much more intensification of the power of what we call parallel economy or black money. And this is a precise question on which Anna Hajare, Swami Ramdev, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, Prashant Bhushan, Kejriwal, everybody was trying to create a cry. And we were mistaken. There is some kind of a situation where we cannot dismiss the whole country as such. I told you, Indian people have moved a bit. You have contributed to the changing of the image of India. And you were educated in India. I was educated in India. And we are doing some of the best things in the world. We have also produced, apart from Rajat Gupta's Amartya Sen's and Ravi Shankar's and many others. So I think it's a mixed bag, but I take your essence of the uh, question and comment that we got to control this greed. At least as a role model, greedy people should not be on the top of the nice people. I would like I think to make a comment. We would want just very, very quick, quick comment. last comments, please. And I would take three or four yeah, comments together. Comments. Uh, sir, you've so already three. talked. I would like to let somebody who hasn't talked talk, please. Okay. Excuse me. I, I, yes, Mandar. And Subra, maybe we'll take both your questions together and Professor Kumar can tie them together. And may I request my moderator friend to allow a bit of gender justice. Are the women today in silence zone or I could not reach to them? Uh, please. Uh, my name is Mandar. I'm What's a graduate student in mechanical engineering here at Northwestern. So my question to you is, uh, if, if your party wants to grow, you'll have to recruit new um, people, yeah, new leaders. Yes. yes. So I want to, uh, I want you uh, to speak about your party's recruiting process for next ele election candidates or new leaders. Very important question. We are trying to ask uh, our members to identify within themselves or outside the party, people who are capable of leading and representing and serving the society. And in the beginning they may deny, they may say not me, him or her, but we want to bring the good of the society in front, in leadership position through our internal search. And here we have this control of nepotism that there are families which are supposed to be monopolizing leadership role. So we have made a rule that in our party, no two members of the same family will be allowed to occupy positions of leadership so that there is multiplication, expansion. The second thing is that we are trying to generate capacity for mobilization through courage of conviction, RTI activism, activism against corruption, activism against violence, on children, women, and old people, so that you become leader through your activities and not through your genealogy or genetic pool or your DNA. And hopefully, this will all will this all will pay us, and other parties will also get back to the genuine democratic process of leadership building. Because there is a great disconnect today between leadership building process 
and the people out there at the grassroots level. So, uh, you talk, uh, so my name is Subramanian. Uh, I'm a graduate student in electoral. Yes, Subramanian. So you talk about uh, political parties formed on uh, regional identities, caste identities, re and religious identities, and linguistic identities. Maybe. Sure. Um, so according to me, from time immemorial, India has been a, has, has been a country of several countries. Sure. So I mean, it has identity. always had several princely states, um, several religions. Caste is ingrained in, in our since I don't know when. Um, so as soon as a child is born, he's stamped a Tamil, Brahmin, sure. Hindu. Uh -huh. So how how are you going to? For me, this is like a reality which is going to remain for forever. I mean, for for an educated person like me or you, maybe that, that these these boundaries may not be so significant. Oh, they become much more significant. Maybe so it can can go either way, but. But yeah, I don't see how. You no, know, the idea of uh, idea of identities has to be respected and recognized, and is there in the constitution. We have the freedom to worship our religion. We have the freedom to cultivate our languages. We have the freedom to uh, uh, organize uh, around our cultural and ethnic principles. But to politicize them is the problem. Democracy and caste cannot go together and that's why in our constitution we have committed ourselves to move from caste to castelessness in what in public affairs we have decided to move from religion to secularism in public affairs in private you may be belonging to a religion an ethnic group a caste group no problem with the constitution of india but democracy particularly representation process requires you to be talking about interest groups common cause and not sectarian interests. Caste parties and regional parties have been created because of the failure of these larger parties. Congress was the party which was more like a melting pot. But now Congress has become, as I said, an instrument of certain categories of people. It has become exclusive rather than inclusive. So regional parties emerged in 1967. There are certain castes and communities which became underrepresented in the mainstream parties, Bharti Janta Party, left parties, Congress. So they decided to create their own regional political parties or caste-based parties. But this is only part of the pathology. And we have to bring them back to the idea of nation building and not caste building. Because they are being left behind, they have to talk in terms of their caste-related needs. But let us hope that they'll move from sectarian to holistic approach. If women of India today are asking for women reservation, I don't blame them because they have waited 65 years. If there are certain other parties, uh, communities, like you have Telangana movement, Telangana Rashtra Parishad, if they feel that we have been cheated by all major parties and therefore we have to have a regional political discourse, like you had Uttarakhand, Kranti Dal, Jharkhand Mukti Morcha, is part of the beauty of democracy that it allows the local, regional, provincial to get integrated into the national. But if the national is missing, then they become destructive. They become fragmentary. And that's where our problem is, that we don't have a common agenda and as an inclusive agenda. It was promised by Congress, Congress ka haath aam admi ke saath. We will go for inclusive growth. They failed it miserably in the second term. And that creates a, a space for a new initiative for an All India Party, which is inclusive, which is attending to the needs of these deprived groups, so that they are not forced to reduce their stature from Indian to a Jharkhandi or a Telangana or a particular community or caste. They are doing it under compulsion of survival. Yeah. Okay. We have a last yes, question please. from this lady, and then we yeah. Vote of have thanks. to conclude yeah. much against everyone's wishes. Uh, hi, I'm Sujata. I'm a volunteer here with the AAP Chicago. Uh, my question is sort of uh, taking off from your previous point about uh, activism in, and the need for activism in uh, India right now. But for me, it looks like act there has been no dearth of activism. There is like from, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago at least that I can remember, there has been the Narmada Bachao Andolan, there has been, there's, activism is never, is not the issue. 
they all seem to come to like a, like a crisis point, like a major point where things seem like it's, it has to resolve and there's no other way, but then it sort of fizzles out. So do you think, do you still think that activism, I mean, okay, two parts, I guess. So first is, what is the reason for this, for this fizzling out of this activism? Is it short attention span or what? And the second thing is, do you think activism is separate to politics? Like, uh, I'm, so this started off India Against Corruption movement, which was an activist movement. And now we have started as a, we've entered into the political foray as Aam Aadmi Party. So do you think all activism should now lead to the lead to politics, or do you think activism can be a healthy parallel to political? Yeah, you see, your your question is very important, and it has been baffling us. Uh, we have been bothered about two kinds of activism. One is activism for change, and the other is activism for power. And some kind of contradiction was perceived by people in the 70s and the 80s. Actually, it began with Gandhians in 1940s, when Gandhiji suggested that now freedom has come, Congress should be disbanded, and there should be Lok Sevak Sangh. And a large number of Gandhians decided to move out of political process and do constructive work. And we realize now, after 65 years, that no matter how many Vinoba Bhaves and Jayaprakash Narayan and Mother Teresa are there, for constructive work, there is a larger macro destructive process. And that is coming from an alliance between vested interest and political decision makers. And we leave this platform of collective imagination, parliament, assembly, panchayat, in a very decentralized, very centralized and perverted form to people who have very narrow vision. So this disconnect between people in power and people in need created this vision that don't politicize it. Let us make it non-party. And this non-party civil society activism is mother of political activism. Once you are trained there, then you move up, you graduate there. This is your primary school. Only then you must be allowed to go up. This is your training ground to think about the larger question, river, water, gender justice, caste, religion. But then the process of lawmaking is something which has to be also attended by sensitive, capable, committed people. We expected that by listening to the waves from the ground, my dear friends sitting in assembly and parliament will respond creatively. They have become indifferent, attitude of benign neglect. So you have to tackle that power steering so that the laws are not made against common people. And it is making some impact, but not sufficiently. You know that there are four laws which have been created even by this government, which are a result of this larger activism, which is non-party activism. First law was right to information. It was an important contribution of non-party civil society activism. The second law was right to education. It was a movement from the days of Rabindranath Tagore and Dayanand Saraswati and Sir Sayyid Ahmed and Zakir Hussain and commitment of constitution, right to education. The third law which has come is Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act which has been generally right to work related movement coming from variety of groups, generally smaller political parties and radical movements. And the fourth law is right to forest act which has been a protest of the radicals and non-radicals talking about the tribals and tribals themselves. But we need many more laws. This is more like firefighting operation. And that's why the lawmaking process, which we never expected to go that wrong. The lawbreakers are becoming lawmakers. Corrupt people under CBI lens for years together are chief ministers and cabinet ministers in the name of coalition dharma, compulsions of politics. And they say, why these people are getting elected? If once they get elected, they become our destiny makers. So they blame the voters. And there was a solution from Gandhians, Matadata Shikshan. But you know, more elections, more fragmentation. Voters' awareness is insufficient 
because the alternatives are not there. So they started voting lesser even. We had a wave of non-congressism that Congress is mother of all corruption. There are parties with a difference and there were parties with a difference. But once they came into power, they became cousin, brothers and sisters. Sometimes they look like twins and the younger one was worse than the older one. So now you have to think about a balanced politics where all the three walks of life, executive, legislature and judiciary are within the accountability principle. All three have become unbridled horses and therefore you have to rethink this strategy of Gandhians, Maoists, uh, environmentalists, feminists, secularists, human rights activists that they keep on generating fire and you keep on doing firefighting operation. It's like allowing a, 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 a person to pollute the water and down the stream you keep on cleaning the water, you check the pollution out there, which is the political power system. So I think I just invite Munish to sort of conduct the final proceedings here. I think. Thank you for Hassanan Kumarji. Uh, uh, now I invite uh, Mr. Ram Kondre to say a word of thanks. It, it was a really very, very inspiring speech. Do you all feel the same? Yes. yes. Yeah. It, it, it is extremely difficult to discuss uh, such a very complicated <laughs> subject in the world about Indian politics. So um, I think uh, we uh, it requires a lot of tenacity and then work hard into it and so many intellectuals putting together with a, uh, selfless thoughts and hard work can probably really change the Indian scenario. But uh, we really thank Professor um, Anand Kumar and uh, the students of Northwestern University and Dr. Munish and a media person and all the guests for coming over and making it a, a pretty small group but very grand success. I thank you so much. Thank you. And, yeah. I also invite Shalini Guptaji to say a few words. So I, I just want to again thank Professor Anand Kumar for coming all the way uh, to Chicago and giving us this really informative uh, talk. Um, he's put for us in beautiful perspective, tracing all the way from the history of India, the context of the current conditions, uh, which have led to the creation of the Amadmi Party and also the emergence of hope. Um, and I. I'm very fortunate to have uh, had the opportunity to travel back and forth to India since the Aam Admi Party was launched in November and work with uh, uh, Professor Anand Kumar in India uh, uh, with the Aam Admi Party. And I also reminded him the first time I met him in Delhi that I have a link with him which goes far back because I'm also an alumni of uh, the sociology department of Jawaharlal Nehru University. So, uh, I, you know, even after having worked with Professor Anand back in India, I, I found the lecture fascinating because uh, in our own home ground here, to have him come here and tell us in, in the level of detail that he did, all the contextual forces that are creating this and are, are creating such hope for the future. So I feel blessed and fortunate that I have the opportunity to volunteer with this. I don't call it a political party. I call it work of God. I went there and I came back. I've done that a few times and I'm going to go back again this year. And my co-workers at work asked me, you know, so what did you do over there? And I said, you know, I really felt like I sat in the poorest neighborhood of one of the poorest countries of the world and I was doing God's work. And so I've come back feeling blessed. And I feel like that's the spirit with which I saw the Aam Admi Party volunteers. We have like about 
8 to 10,000 ground volunteers. I feel the Aam Admi Party has what no other party or no other organization in India has today. It has a ground volunteer army fueled on the spirit of patriotism and sacrifice. And I've seen it with my own eyes. And I've worked with these people. And I've sat in Sundar Nagri from morning to night, sitting there with these people who are, you know, working day and night for to bring this change about. So while we are lamenting on the woes of India and all the things that could be wrong with where we are today, we have this beautiful uh, reality of India that there are all these people who are volunteering their sweat and blood to bring this change about. So I, I feel feel very fortunate to be even a, this much a part of it. And I was very touched with the, com with the warmth and love that I received over there with, from people who have so little but are so willing to share. So I thank you, Professor yes. Anand, for coming again and for all of you for uh, listening to this story, this very compelling story. Thank you. Thank you very much. From our side, this evening is officially closed. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thanks, Kedar, for helping me organize the whole event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just one.